This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by Titan Auto and Tire. Titan has some of the very few independent auto repair shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. Coming up this week, Honda wants to make edgy EVs. Foreign allies are not too happy with our EV tax credit. GMC stole and then photoshopped a photo from Rivian and more. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 127 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. I've got a packed show as always for you, but before we get to the news this week, I want to welcome a new supporter to the EV Resource Patreon family. Everybody scoot over and make room for Alan Michael joining us at the producer tier. Members of this tier receive a number of benefits, including having their name read out on the podcast monthly, in the show notes always, they gain access to the ad-free podcast episodes and are invited to join me for our monthly Zoom hangout I've named the Water Cooler Chat. So welcome, Alan. I appreciate your support, and I look forward to getting to know you better. Leading us off, a story about Honda and their future plans that seem to be contradictory to the fun cars of their past. The company isn't quite ready to give up on the manual transmission yet, but they are also very realistic about how the dawning EV era likely spells an end for the stick shift as we know it. During an interview with Car and Driver, Honda CEO Toshihiro Mibe and head of electrification Shinzi Aoyama both expressed doubt that Honda would pursue any sort of simulated or artificial manual transmissions for its upcoming EVs, not even for the electric sports cars that are already a part of its confirmed future lineup. Aoyama said, quote, artificially we can do it, mechanically it's not that easy, end quote, and he referred to the idea of a simulated manual transmission like an extension of active sound control. He personally does not like the idea of an artificial solution like this and said that Honda would pursue other ways of making its EVs fun to drive. Mibe said that it's important for Honda EVs to be edgy and distinct from competitors in terms of the driving experience, but added, quote, I'm not sure if we can replace the manual transmission, end quote. And this is something that I agree with. I think EVs are fun to drive even without a manual transmission. There is absolutely no need to have different gears for electric motors because they make power along such a wide range of RPMs, unlike the internal combustion engine that has a very small RPM range where it's making its peak power. That's why you need a manual transmission or a transmission in general to always be keeping the engine either in that power band or for efficiency to have like an overdriven gear on the highway. So I agree with Honda on this one generally. While traditionally the most fun cars to drive have been ones with manual transmissions, EVs are fun to drive even without that experience. But there are a few companies that believe their customers want to retain a driving experience similar to a manual transmission, even if they're in an EV. Toyota actually recently patented a system for EVs that includes a clutch, a gear shifter, and virtual gear ratios. Lexus president Koji Sato also expressed a desire for the brand's upcoming EV supercar to have some sort of simulated manual transmission. And even before that, Toyota's GRHV sport concept from 2017 also incorporated a sort of simulated manual transmission. Its hybrid powertrain used its automatic gearbox, but featured a shift lever meant to mimic a six-speed manual transmission. I, I I honestly could go both ways. EVs are fun to drive anyway uh, because you've got that instant torque. So I think the worst way to approach this would be if you changed that instant torque feeling where you step on it and boom, you got the power right then and there. If they kind of backed that off and ramped power through a simulated power band until you needed to shift and then continued that, I think that would be the wrong way of doing it. But I can't think of maybe the right way either. So this is interesting. As EVs do eventually take over at Honda, the company assures us that there will continue to be vehicles with enthusiast appeal Honda has promised two electric sports cars, one described as a flagship model and another as a specialty model. 
Teaser images showed that both have low slung proportions and the flagship model would likely serve as the Acura NSX's replacement. So this is going to be exciting one way or the other. I look forward to seeing how Honda can win over automotive traditionalists, even if they won't have manual transmissions or any approximation of one. And this story has actually inspired me to bring back the question of the week. So I am going to do that. This is going to be the question of the week. What do you think? Should Honda explore the idea of an artificial manual transmission for EVs? What I'm going to do here is actually I'm going to make a Patreon poll and read the results on the show next week. The Patreon poll will be available for everyone to vote in, even if you're not a supporter of the show. So head over to patreon.com slash EV resource. The poll should be the top thing or one of the top things there and join in the conversation. I really want to um, see what you think. Next, spy shots of a prototype European EV hot hatch are making the news. Motor One has released some spy photos of the upcoming Fiat Abarth 500 EV, and it is noticeably different from the base 500E model it looks to complement. While nearly the entire car is covered in thick camouflage, the front and rear bumpers and side skirts are different. The front bumper has an air intake that is a completely different shape than the 500E version we already know. The side skirts appear to protrude a bit more, especially in front of the rear wheels. And the rear bumper is expected to have diffusers, and there's a large prominent rear spoiler as well. And while it will look sportier, it's going to have some extra power to match. According to the report, the Abarth 500 EV will shave two seconds off the current model's acceleration to 62 miles an hour to just seven seconds. And yes, that doesn't sound like a very quick EV when many of them are sporting sub six second times. I can assure you that it'll still be plenty of fun to drive. As an example, my Spark EV only does 0 to 60 in about 7 seconds or so, and it's a freaking blast to drive, so I'm sure this will be great as well. Power output is expected to be around 170 horsepower or so, but there has been no conclusive reporting from Fiat on this. What we do know is the production model Abarth 500 EV should be revealed in the coming months and is expected to go on sale in 2023. The new EV tax credit has received its fair share of criticism from all angles. When the requirements go into effect in January for the battery mineral sourcing and assembly, it is expected to promote North American built vehicles. This is great for companies like GM, Ford, Tesla, and others that are focusing a large effort here in the States. But other companies like those from Japan and South Korea are getting left out, and those countries have noticed. South Korean officials and leaders from Japan are expressing concerns over the new US EV tax credit requirements that kick in at the end of the year. New reports are surfacing that Japan and South Korea will request flexibility in the rule changes. South Korean automaker Hyundai, in particular, has expressed concerns over the upcoming changes. Hyundai already announced its plans to build a $5.5 billion mega EV facility in Georgia in May before the IRA was passed. And since the new climate initiatives passed in August, South Korea's officials have lobbied with U.S. leaders for a grace period to be included in the tax credit, expressing major concerns. Nonetheless, Hyundai accelerated its construction plans, breaking ground on October 25th rather than earlier next year. South Korean officials are not the only foreign leaders concerned with the new rulings. The EU has also asked the United States to allow European automakers to qualify for the tax credit. And recently, new reports are surfacing that South Korean officials and leaders from Japan are asking for more flexibility for non-American car makers. According to a report from the Kyoto News Agency, Japan will soon submit a request for added flexibility in the U.S. EV tax credit for foreign automakers. Japan intends to make nearly completed cars exported from Japan eligible for the tax credits as long as the final assembly process takes place in the United States, Canada, or Mexico. Furthermore, the Japanese government will also ask for its country to be included in the critical mineral tax requirement that currently includes U.S. free trade nations. The news comes shortly after a statement suggesting South Korean officials are pushing for a three-year grace period to allow its automakers to receive the EV tax credit until they get operations up and running at its Georgia facility. So naturally, they don't want to be left out and have to compete with EVs that are essentially as much as $7,500 less expensive in comparison. 
Before the IRA was passed, vehicles from Hyundai and Kia qualified for the tax credit, and they obviously want to get that back. Personally, I like the intent behind the IRA and look forward to seeing more manufacturing and mineral sourcing come here to North America. So we'll see if these requests from our Asian allies gain any traction or fall on deaf ears. My gut is telling me that we shouldn't expect to see any changes to the tax credit anytime soon. Next, an interesting report from Fox News with a headline that grabbed my attention. It reads, Subaru isn't investing in U.S. EV production because McDonald's pay is too high. Okay, (laughs) so if you're like me, you hear that or read it and wonder what the connection could possibly be between the two. So naturally, I clicked on the link and now I've got a story to share with you. See how that works? Subaru currently makes the Solterra in collaboration with Toyota in Japan, not here in the US. And that means that it also no longer qualifies for the EV tax credit. And while the change in the tax credit has pushed some other manufacturers to shift their focus to building vehicles here in North America, Subaru says that they aren't going to be doing that, and the reason is because of wages being too high. Subaru CEO Tomomi Nakamura says, quote, In Indiana, part-time workers at McDonald's earn $20 to $25 per hour, which is in competition with what temporary workers make at our plant. If we were to build a new plant, it would be very difficult to hire new people for that. Labor costs are rising now. It is quite challenging for us to secure workers for an Indiana plant, including those of suppliers." And according to Indeed and Glassdoor, salaries at Subaru's Indiana facility, which employs over 5,900 associates, range from $17 an hour to over $48 an hour. Nakamura said Subaru is planning to be operating its own electric vehicle facility in Japan by 2027, but won't consider adding one in the United States until wage inflation begins to subside. Yeah, good luck on that one. Uh, They are not going to get any sympathy from me on this. If you as a company can't figure out how to make EVs profitably and pay your workers a living wage, then I don't think you deserve to be whining about it. Make changes, look at the other brands that are seeing success, and do what they do. It's not that hard. Okay, well, maybe it is hard, but it's not impossible. And this is just another reason why I expect that the Subaru company gets bought out by another automaker, likely Toyota at this point, because they already own so much of Subaru, Subaru is just such a small company, and they can't seem to just figure out how to survive the transition to EVs. Previously, if you would have asked me maybe a year ago, I would have said that we need as many EV makes and models as possible and would have rooted for Subaru to find some success here. But I've really changed my stance. We have so many companies now across the globe making or planning to make great EVs. I don't think we'll be missing anything if Subaru isn't in the mix. And now that I've alienated all of the Subaru fans listening to this podcast, I'll move on to the next story. And now spreading my criticism to GM, or returning my criticism to GM again, uh, the next story is either a major issue or not one at all, and I'll let you decide. Here's what happened. A recent post on social media by the GM design department got the attention of many people, especially on Twitter, when it became clear that someone at the company stole and then photoshopped a photo of the Rivian R1T to share a rendering of the upcoming GMC Sierra EV Denali. And I'll leave a link to this one in the show notes because you have to see these two photos next to one another. The photo with the GMC and I'm using finger quotes, GMC, is nearly identical to the mirrored image of the Rivian R1T, with the exception being the rear hatch and lights being changed. And of course, it shows Denali and GMC written on the back of the truck. The post was intended as a peek of the GMC's rear view, but of course, Eagle Eye Observer noticed many familiar elements to the rendering, including the wheels and tires, mirrors, doors, and even the backgrounds are identical, including some leaves that the truck is kicking up and a blurred person jogging in the background. The post has since been deleted, naturally, and a GM spokesperson explained the situation to The Drive, saying, quote, The GM design Instagram channel is meant to give followers an inside look at the process of designing new products and the creative teams behind it. 
Often, these posts use sketches made for internal studio use during design development. The sketch in question was intended for internal use only and was posted without necessary approval. It has been removed from the GM Design Instagram page. End quote. So GM says, oops, that was supposed to be just for us. But I think you and I both know that if they had never gotten caught with that photo, it would still be up and they would never have said a word about it. In my personal experience with GM, I have found that they are really, really good at PR and walking something like this back. I want to be clear, I'm not calling them liars, and there's certainly a lot of reason to believe that what they said was true, but this is just one more reason I think we need to take things from GM with a grain of salt. But what do you think about this situation? Is it just not worthy to talk about at all, or do you think this is maybe more of a major issue? And lastly, oil profits are a good thing. Okay, you're probably wondering where I'm going with this, so I'll get right to it. Saudi Arabia, of course, a country known for its oil production and therefore the massive profits as a result, announced that it is launching its own electric car brand called Seer, that's C-E-E-R, in partnership with Foxconn, the makers of the iPhone, the Lordstown Endurance, and soon to be a number of other EVs, and BMW. It's no argument that the shift to electric vehicles is definitely happening a lot faster than most people anticipated. And at this point, I think it could easily be argued that there's no going back. It is inevitable at this point. So even oil companies are getting involved. As an example, BP and Shell, they are investing a lot in electric vehicle charging networks. And Saudi Arabia, historically an oil-based state, has also been investing in electric vehicles. The country was famously part of the talks to take Tesla private, though that never went through, and it has invested a really big chunk of change in Lucid Motors, which plans, of course, to now build a factory in the country. So now, the Saudi Arabian Sovereign Wealth Fund, or PIF, has announced that it wants to get directly involved in the EV space. His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdul Aziz, Prime Minister and Chairman of the PIF, announced the launch of Seer, the first Saudi electric vehicle brand that will contribute to Saudi Arabia's automotive manufacturing sector. PIF confirmed that it has partnered with Foxconn to produce the vehicle. The Taiwan-based manufacturing giant has lately made several moves into electrification with clear plans to become a major producer of electric vehicles. But instead of selling them for itself, Foxconn has made it clear that they would prefer to manufacture EVs for other brands. Under the new PIF deal, Foxconn will get its wish, manufacturing EVs to be sold under the Seer brand. The plan is for its first electric vehicles to be delivered in 2025, though the company didn't go into details about which markets or vehicles they would go after first. So that'll take care of the news segment this week. Before we end, though, I have a couple of announcements and requests. Please, if you would, share this podcast with your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, or if whatever platform you listen to allows for reviews. That helps the algorithm put the EV Resource Podcast in front of more people that are looking to get information about electric vehicles. So it's really super easy, takes very little time, and it's super helpful. If you want to listen to any of the previous podcast episodes, you can find them on the webpage under the podcast section and on all of the best podcast platforms, including audio only on YouTube, if that's your thing. If you are looking for more EV resource content aside from the podcast, I definitely encourage you to check out the YouTube channel and subscribe. I encourage you to follow EV resource across your favorite social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. As always, I want to thank our growing family of Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to Rajiv Narayan at the director tier, Christopher Lawrence and Andy Cooper at the executive producer tier, Charles Hall, Eric Weber, and Alan Michael at the producer tier. If you enjoy the podcast and feel like I've earned your support, that is the best way to show your appreciation through Patreon. If you've been on the fence about supporting my efforts, please head over to patreon.com slash EV resource and check out all the benefits of becoming a patron. Finally, I invite your feedback via email to hello at EV resource.com. And that is it for this podcast. So thank you so much for being with me and I'll catch you next time.